This is the same drainage pattern that exists today. Generally, precipitation flows toward the center of the continent through the Mississippi Valley River Basin. Water generally flows from the High Plains to the east and from the Appalachians to the west. The ancient sea in the Midwest could only have been there if there was no ocean for the Mississippi River Basin to drain to. All of the really old fish fossils and marine fossils are found on land. You will not find many fossils in the ocean because they are relatively new compared to the age of the earth. As the continents began to break apart and create lower seafloor plates, the water from the seas on the land began to flow into the newly formed rifts. These rifts spew out all sorts of gases, methane, sodium, chlorine, oxygen, hydrogen, and all the noble gases. This explains why all oceans are all salt water, from the mixing of sodium and chlorine gases within the water. Yet almost every body of water on land is fresh water. Current plant life easily shows that the continents were all once together on a smaller planet. Since North America was separated by a large sea, plant life is very different on the east coast and west coasts. Tree life in New England is the same as trees in Europe, while plant life in Florida is similar to the rainforest in South America and Africa. Without any oceans, the rainforest plant type would have extended around the globe to Indonesia and on to the southern California area. Trees in the northern part of North America are the same tree life found in the Soviet Union. An earth with no oceans would be about a quarter of the size it is today. That means that gravity during the reign of the dinosaurs was also about a quarter or less of what it is today, about 200 million years ago. This reduction in gravity is shown by the huge sizes of animals and plants back then. Dragonflies had two-foot wingspans. Scorpions and centipedes were a massive size compared to today. In less gravity, life forms can take on larger size because the forces are much weaker on the body, and size is an advantage to both predator and prey. Even if oxygen levels were much higher back then, which is often an excuse as to why animals were so large, it doesn't explain the large plant life. From fossils, paleontologists can prove that the bone densities of the dinosaurs were no more dense than that of, of human Yet many dinosaurs were so big that if today's gravity were the same back then, they wouldn't be able to walk, let alone hunt, without breaking bones. The bones of larger dinosaurs would not be able to take the kinds of force necessary to run, hunt, or fight, and they would simply snap. Scientists have found brontosaurus footprints on dry land, proving that the large creatures did not reside in water. One of the largest dinosaurs, Argentinosaurus, was 120 feet long and weighed over 100 tons. At that size and that weight, it would be like a blue whale living on land. You can't grow that large on land in today's gravity and expect to function in any way. A blue whale uses its buoyancy in the water to offset its massive weight due to gravity. A blue whale cannot live on land. Its massive size would crush its own bones, and it would die very quickly. There is just no way these creatures could have ever walked on land in today's gravity, yet there is fossil proof that they were land animals. The largest known predator is Spinosaurus bigger than a T-Rex, weighing up to 8 tons. If you look at the legs of these predators, one can easily see these dinosaurs were extremely fast and powerful, and they used their speed to hunt down prey. In contrast, an elephant leg is more built for support, but not for any great speed. Elephants can't really run, they can only walk fast, and they can't jump. Today's gravity is too strong to allow something that big to be fast and agile, a must if they were to survive. Stromatolites, a type of coral, builds a new layer on itself every day. 
So in one year you can count 365 layers of the coral. Yet in the geological past, this same coral would produce 450 to 800 layers a year, indicating much shorter days in a year. The Earth may have been spinning faster when it was small, the same way an ice skater spinning increases when they bring in their arms and spin. Even ancient petrified sand dunes found in sandstone suggest lower surface gravity at the time they were preserved. Every soil has what is called an internal angle of friction. You can see this at the quarry when sand is dumped into a huge pile and its slopes form a certain maximum angle. As more sand is piled on top of it, the sand gets too steep and will eventually resettle to a shallower, more stable angle. Ancient sand dunes have been shown to have higher slopes, indicating larger internal angles of friction, which suggests that they were made in an environment that had much less gravity than today. Mountain building and earthquakes are also explained much easier on an earth that is growing. Since the continents are stationary, fixed to the earth, they do not drift, and there are two major forces that build mountains. The first is compressional forces exerted on the land by spreading seas. Imagine a piece of tin foil as a continent. Place your hand on either side of the foil and swing your hands together until your thumbs meet. This crumpling of the continent is one way mountains are made. India didn't crash into Asia. It did, however, break from Africa while it was still attached to Asia. The ocean spreading simply has folded the continent. The other way is very simple. The continents have to recurve from time to time because as the earth grows, the continent's curvature is greater than the curvature that is what is beneath the continent. So the continent forms a massive stone bridge that has to collapse every so often. Imagine the flattening out of a grapefruit on a basketball. The skin of the fruit would have to break to recurve to the basketball. This is why earthquakes can happen anywhere, and one time the Mississippi ran backwards after an earthquake. Samuel Carey analyzed various data and found that the earth was growing at a rate of about six inches in circumference per year and accelerating exponentially. Although the exact amount of growth is still in debate, even satellite data have to be adjusted for inconsistencies that they have come across since GPS satellites have been introduced. The growth of the Earth doesn't come from dust and meteors from space. It comes from deep thermal vents, or rifts, where the oceans are spreading. Here, hot gases continue to blow out from them constantly along with upheaval of magma, creating new matter and spreading the ocean floor. Yet because the Earth is not massive enough and doesn't have large enough gravitational forces, gases blow off into space from the upper atmosphere all the time. There are 80,000 miles of mid-oceanic rifts ejecting gases and lava all the time. There are countless volcanoes that erupt frequently, bringing mass to the surface. But where on the Earth do you find the opposite happening? Where do you find an influx of matter traveling into the Earth to make up for all the matter that is being released? There are so few sinkholes that it can't really be a possibility. There is evidence that celestial bodies make their own matter, at least anything with a magnetic field. But how can that happen? In 1932, Carl Anderson discovered a particle called a positron and won the Nobel Prize. A positron is just like an electron, the same weight and size, but it has a positive charge. Later on, scientists discovered that the positron is made from a photon striking something, something our technology can't identify yet. When it strikes it, the photon makes both a positron and an electron. The positron immediately seeks out a new electron and they both disappear again. So science called that antimatter. Science used to believe in something called ether, an ocean of subatomic particles in the universe. Even Einstein believed in it. 
There has been some experiments with lasers to claim that ether doesn't exist, but the experiments were under the assumption that light is affected by ether. The Earth has a magnetic field of both positive and negative lines. So when a positron is created along a negative field line of the Earth, it would be protected from any negatively charged electrons, since like charges repel each other. An atom is mostly empty space, just like the solar system. Positrons trapped on the negative magnetic lines of the Earth could easily travel to the Earth's center and be made by a natural process into an atom's nucleus. Now a proton and a neutron, the larger particles that make up an atom's nucleus, have atomic weights that are exact multiples of positrons and electrons. If you can imagine a simple process of positrons massing together to form larger particles, an introduction of an electron would create a hydrogen atom. And the heat and pressure inside the Earth can build all other atoms from a hydrogen atom. These atoms are then forced up through the Earth through the oceanic rifts. You see this happen throughout our solar system. The northern lights are radioactive subatomic particles trapped in the magnetic field of the Earth. But this is not unique to Earth. Jupiter, Saturn, all have northern and southern lights. Any celestial body close enough to the sun that has a magnetic field will have northern and southern lights. There are many things that we have discovered over the years that show us just how fact can be stranger than fiction. New scientific discoveries happen all the time that force us to rewrite our textbooks and change the way we view things in the future. New discoveries that change scientific theory forever and change the way we look at our universe.